Good morning. Good morning and welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ. It is good to be together here this morning. My name is Sharon Benton and I am the lead pastor here at First Congregational. My pronouns are she and her and it is a joy to welcome you whether you are here in this space or in the bigger balcony worshiping with us wherever you happen to be at this time, welcome. The joy I get to offer each time we enter a worship space together are these words, and I pray that you can hear them and soak them in as for you. No matter who you are, and no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You are beloved of God. Let's worship. Okay, we're gonna try this this week again. Ready? Woah ya ya, 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 woah ya ya. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within. And we'll get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within and we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. It may be hard, I know, and the road may be muddy and rough, but we'll get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within and we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. It may be hard, I know, and the road may be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there. But we know we will. We are going, heaven. 
heaven knows where we are going, but we know within and we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. It may be hard, I know, and the road may be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Scripture today comes from the book of Galatians. And in Galatians, Paul is angry. It's easy to read this part of Paul, or this uh, Paul in this part of Scripture, as wanting to do away with the law, right? As seeing the law as inadequate or antiquated. But even Jesus says, I have not come to do away with the law but to fulfill it, right? You know that passage. The law has a function to direct, to direct people toward actions that lead to abundant life, a society where everyone can thrive, sort of benchmarks, foundation, perimeter. Paul wasn't upset about the law itself or even about people honoring and following the law. What had Paul so angry was exchanging trust in Jesus, transformation through Jesus, belonging in the kingdom for a self-righteous pursuit of individual holiness. The Galatians had traded in trust for blind commitment to the law. Instead of resting into their place within God's kingdom, they were busy trying to prove something. In some parts of the progressive social justice world, a space where my calling outside of my time with you uh, resides, there are a lot of rules. And many of these rules are so helpful, much like the law, the swirling rules of the social justice milieu push us to recognize oppression and injustice and to strive toward dignity, equity, justice, and sometimes just basic kindness. Other rules, though, seem a little less tethered to real change for good. They feel more like a litmus test. Some of these rules are unspoken. Others are explicit, all dutifully enforced. Step outside the rules question the orthodoxy, slip up and say the wrong thing, and the retaliation can be swift and cruel. Adherence to the rules, that is what keeps you safely in the fold. Not an earnest question, not an honest mix-up, not even devotion to the truth, but sticking by the team earns you your belonging in some progressive social justice spaces, much like it did for the folks in Galatia. There's no better way to shut down collaboration than to leverage shame. No way more certain to destroy psychological safety in a relationship than to publicly ridicule someone for being vulnerable. Shame is always a tool of oppression. Shame is the antithesis of transformation. And that's where today's conversation comes in. We are in a time of rapidly expanding understanding of all the different ways that we can be human. We are naming so many previously undescribed ways to experience ourselves. 
We are coming to see so many new things about how humans are created and how we are co-creating who we are. The old structures, the law, that ordered society and families, that helped us to feel secure in our place, to understand our role, to make sense of one another. Many of those notions are being challenged or dispensed with. But it is not within clearly ordered boxes that we find our true calling and belonging. It's in the transformation of our heart. Paul said it first. In Christ, there is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, no boxes to exclude or to privilege. The old systems no longer responded to the new reality ushered in by the life and work of Jesus. The oneness of humanity, the intricately bound up together destiny of humanity. In the face of this kind of change, what did the Galatians do? What can we do? It's easy to resort to some kind of ordering of rules. It's also an impulse for many of us to protect the changes that we've managed to achieve, to define and assert new rules for engaging. The law, for all its goodness and helpfulness, was and is not in the business of transformation. I can tell someone about pronouns and how to use them respectfully, lovingly even, but that alone won't lead to a change of heart, a genuine care and respect for gender diverse people. No, that takes transformation. And transformation requires not adherence to a set of rules, but a sense of safety, space to be vulnerable, and a commitment to stay in relationship. Today, we will be hearing from two young people who can teach us about some of these new ways of being human, of what makes their lives better and easier. I'm excited for you to meet these two dear ones of mine. And after service, we will have a conversation that's intended to spark transformation, a space where we can work together to live up to the trust placed in us by each other's vulnerability, earnest questions, and commitment to stay in relationship no matter how different our life experiences might be. I hope you will stay and join in. Brandon's going to come up and help me with time with children. Hi. Oh, it's Brandon, maybe. Or maybe my own connection. I'm sorry. Yet again, a mistake um, from my part. Can you sit right on that button right there? Thank you so very much. And I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. How could I do that? Has it ever happened before? Um, let's just say in grade school, it was a day-to-day -day occurrence. <laughs> what about, has it ever happened with me before? Uh, well, did. And that's a yes. Because sometimes I call Matthew Mark, who is my brother, because he reminds me of my brother. But he's not my brother, so that's a mistake. And all of us make mistakes, and we say the wrong thing sometimes. Me too. I know that'll be hard for you to believe. But I'm going to start by inviting every kid who's here, who wants to come up, to come up. You don't have to, but I love helpers, so that's where we're going to begin. <gasps> Thank you for being my helper. 
we can sit around. I have a pool here. I wanted to get a real pool. I want you all to know that I went out looking for real kiddie pools. It's so hot here, there are none. <laughs> but I'm going to begin with a poem by a guy named Shel Silverstein. And his poem is called Love, and it's not very long. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and begin. Ricky was L, but he's home with the flu. Lizzie, our O, had some homework to do. Mitchell E probably got lost on the way. So I'm all of love that could make it today. Sometimes in our world, we find that we aren't getting all we need. But one thing that I want to share with you is in this place, in this faith family, you can all get what you need every time. Not all the time at the same time, but over time, everything will become made clear to you. We all have this thing in this place. We have fake aunts and fake uncles. And we have fake grandparents and fake brothers and sisters and just friends. Because sometimes we don't know how to define those things. It's just our job to L O. Oh, hold that. V E and love and pull that all together for one another. So in that bag, Brendan, can you see what's in there? Uh, it would have been more fun with water balloons, but Kurt would not love me if I brought water balloons into the sanctuary. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is share these little bubbles of love. Every single one of these bubbles represents love. And you can all come swim in it any time you'd like. Can you help me to fill that? And if you want to take your bag and share it with some of the fake aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas, they can help fill it too because they will fill it. And they will fill it for you over and over again. And if you ever need to swim in some love, you can find it here. And I hope... Well, sometimes it can be deeper than it, you might expect. You may jump into the ball. You can jump into the love. That's perfect, and I'm sorry it's not bigger or deeper. And I love you all. Thank you so very much for coming to Time with Children and enjoying your time bathing in love. Please join me in the uh, community prayer as printed in your bulletins. In the image of God, you created everything and called it good. 
In abundant diversity, your likeness is found in us. We reject all that belittles or degrades anyone among us. And so in faithfulness to God and one another, we proclaim, sacred are our bodies, each as they are. Blessed are our sexualities, drawing us towards love of many kinds. Beloved is every gender, revealing you in different ways. To our skin, beautiful in every shade, we say hallelujah. Praise God, our creator, who blesses us with this world, these bodies, and our sibling creatures, all created good, very good. This is the time when we get to share the prayers that we have been holding throughout the week with one another so that we all can share those prayers with you. And if you are in the bigger balcony worshiping, we invite you to type prayers into the Facebook or Zoom comments, and we will pray those prayers with you later this week as well. I begin with a few prayers. One is for those caring for loved ones through cognitive decline. We know that there are many of you out here, and so it is a special kind of love that you share, and we hold you in our prayers. We ask continued healing for Tim Shepard, who continues to be in rehabilitation care. So prayers for Tim. And prayers of gratitude for the life of Dale Kimball. We got to celebrate his life yesterday here. And prayers of gratitude for our memorial garden, which is just outside, where members' ashes can be shared and intermingled with one another. It's such a wonderful thing to have uh, a space here in our own community where we can do that. What else are you praying for this morning? holding Stacy and Maddie Miller Malone in our prayers as they were celebrating the second anniversary of Bert's passing this week. Thank you. Deep and sincere prayers for John's protection. Thank you. Prayers, prayers of healing for daughter Carrie, who's healing from a broken foot. Prayers for our country amidst the disagreements and wondering what will happen with this next election. Healing for Tim as she does come home next week. Okay. 
prayer for Marit's sister, Kari, um, whose leg will not heal. For Bill's mom, who just celebrated her 96th birthday, and for brother and sister-in-law who care for her through her cognitive decline. Yeah, Janet. Gratitude for new babies born and new babies about to be born. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> We gather our spoken prayers alongside this, the prayers we've been holding silent into a time of communal silent prayer. O divine, you bless us with new life and new possibility. The opportunity for transformation in so many ways. And yet the path to that transformation sometimes feels strewn with not just rocks, but bricks, rubble, fallen trees. Help us find our paths of God over and around and through not just for our own transformation, but for the transformation of this world, for the healing of our nation and all nations, for the healing and care of one another, for balls of love to fill up this space and every space that we encounter when we are able. May we continue to fill it up with your love, with your guidance to transformation. This I pray in your many names, and we join our voices together in praying the prayer of Jesus, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The scripture this morning is Galatians 3, 23 to 28 from the New Revised Standard Version and tweaked a bit by Pastor Page. 
Okay, now before faith came, we were cradled safely by the law until faith would be revealed. The law helped us to build a good, abundant life until Christ came so that we might be reckoned as righteous by faith. But now that we are guided by trust in Jesus, we are called to go beyond the letter of the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed themselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. All right, Emma Blue, we need to turn you off mute. There we go. And Noah, we need a mic for, great. Well, I am pretty excited to have a couple of friends here with me. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but I wanna tell you first how I know these two young folks. As part of my work as an advocate for LGBTQ youth, um, it became clear that it was important for my integrity that I continue to cultivate relationships with LGBTQ youth so that whatever I'm saying or doing on their behalf is what they would want me to say and do on their behalf. So every month we meet online on Zoom for about an hour and I learn a lot. Um, and you know, I eat, sleep and breathe queer and trans youth uh, and I read everything I can get my hands on, all the new books, all the new research, all the new articles, and yet I sit down with these two, or four, or six of them, or however many show up that month, and I always learn something new. I always gain new insights. Um, and I pay them for their expertise, so they are being paid also for being here this morning. That's also an important part of the integrity of um, learning from their experience. So, um, so that's how I know these two beloved young people. They both live in Bellingham. Um, well, uh, well, you introduce yourselves uh, and offer the community here um, your name and pronouns. Um, my name's Emma Blue, and I use any pronouns. My name's, is this on? Yeah, okay. good. My name's Noah, and I use they, he pronouns. Thanks, team. Um, so I built this set of questions alongside them, um, so these won't be a surprise, just so you know. Um, will you please tell us a little bit about your journey of coming to know yourself, coming to see your true identity, and if you're comfortable, um, maybe share some of the language that you use to define yourself uh, in ways that fit at least right now. So I kind of grew up uh, not really thinking much about gender. Um, of course, I was like socialized in a certain way and dressed a certain way, but I never really correlated in my mind with like, that's what I am. Um, so in terms of gender, I just say I'm gender queer, which is like an umbrella term. I don't really have a specific label. Um, I don't feel like any kind of gender, I just kind of exist as I am. Um, and I kind of just grew up being attracted to a lot of different people. And I'm very lucky that I was never told that that was wrong. So I also just say I'm queer because I don't have like a specific label that I subscribe to. Um, and I just like all different kinds of people. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Um, a lot like Emma, I grew up not really knowing gender, not really seeing them as a friend. And, um, and then as I grew into school ages, I learned more about the binary and like what it means to be a gender. Um, and I, I had a very 
interesting flowy journey with gender throughout elementary school and middle school. Um, and I went through several identities before I settled on gender fluid, which to me means I experience different genders, different combinations of genders and different intensities of genders varying day to day and week to week, year to year. Um, and I just love all people. That's, that's how I identify I'm queer and just people fascinate me and I love all of them. Thanks, you too. Noah, when we talked last, you mentioned the importance um, of the role of older queer folks in your life. Can the two of you tell me a little bit more about what it means to have people of different ages who are also LGBTQ identified in your life and why that's important to you? Um, I was very lucky and I got to grow up uh, surrounded by lesbians, it was great. Um, my parents had a lot of queer friends um, and I think that really helped me like growing up kind of figure out who I was because I just got to see like all different kinds of love around me and again wasn't told that like that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, and I think a, a lot of those people in my life helped me like come into who I am and figure out um, what I like and just who I am as a person, even not like in terms of like gender and sexuality, but just like helping me as like a human being, like the things that I like to do and like the music I listen to and just there's so many aspects of culture that are mixed in with like queer culture that kind of helped shape me. I totally echo everything you said. Um, <laughs> I feel like I grew up with many queer relatives and friends and mm. I didn't learn until later in my life that some people don't like these things and think that you're wrong. Um, and so I was just always encouraged to be myself and um, their support, the support of older queer folks and queer folks who have been walked this journey before me. Um, it's very helpful to know that there is someone who's got my back who has been through the same thing as me. Thank you. And I would just reflect that, you know, that's a really marked generational shift, right? To grow up with visible LGBTQ people around you and having the ability to identify them be in relationship with them and see them as good, right? Not as dangerous or threatening or somehow wrong or bad. That's a big shift and, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a blessing that both of these young people have had this experience and in my work is still not so common, right? Yeah, so thank you so much. If you could ask just a few things from all the adults in this world, queer or not, what would it be? I would say just let us exist as we are. I think even within like the queer community, there are certain identities that are stigmatized and like people don't accept. And I think that ultimately it just hurts all of us um, to not just let people be who they are and um, let us express ourselves how we want to express ourselves. Um, and I think everyone could just be more accepting and, and try a little harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I think what Paige is doing in their work is really important, which is listening to us um, and hearing our stories and hearing what we have to say and how we want to describe ourselves and how you want to be seen and who you want to be seen with, everything like that. Um, just listening is very important to learning about queer youth and learning about queer people. And like Emma said, there's a lot of stigma in and around the community. And I think that just learning to accept all sorts of people is really important. 
That's a great lead in to my next question, which actually wasn't on the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have a little bit of extra time today. What are some of your favorite things about being queer or, be, or about the queer community? I think we're all pretty cool people <laughs> who, I don't know, I don't know if I've seen like a queer person who doesn't look super cool and awesome. Um. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> As a midlife lesbian who buys my clothes at Costco, I will take that. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that we're all just so like loving and accepting of everyone. And I think we really put ourselves out there and like try. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a really good quality that everyone can have. Like there's a possibility for everyone to have that in, them, in themselves. But mm -hmm. I think we just kind of exude like welcoming energy. Mm -hmm. Lovely. My favorite part of being in the queer community is I feel like I have friends wherever I go. I feel mm -hmm. like I, I mean, I do have this community that is just so welcoming and accepting of everything I am that is outside of the norm. And I really feel like I can call every single one of them friends without even knowing them. And that's very important to me. Yeah. I, I came out 24 years ago and I remember as I was first beginning to meet people, we used the term other LGBTQ people. We used the term family to describe one another. I don't hear that as much anymore, but it was true then and it's true now that we are a family. We can see each other across the room or in Whole Foods or wherever it is, and there's this moment of like, all right, there you are, here I am, we're together, we're not alone. Um, and I see that a lot too in y'all's love of all things flags. And, uh, and, you know, those flags um, are pretty um, what it, pervasive among LGBTQ youth, all the different combinations of colors and shapes that they'll put on a pin or on a patch on their backpack or even sometimes wrap around their shoulders. And what that is doing, what that flag does for them, it says, I'm not alone. It's not just me out here in Linden or even in downtown Bellingham. I belong to something big and beautiful and creative and strong. I'm part of an arc of history that didn't just start when I was born, but I stand on the shoulders of people who paved the path for us to be sitting here in church, y'all, <laughs> right? <laughs> Listening to the voices of queer youth, right? And saying prayers about the sacredness of our bodies and, and our genders, right? It gives me goosebumps just to think about, you know, the power of these conversations and these moments. Yeah. When you say standing on the shoulders of the people before us, I like to call those people my transcestors. Your transcestors. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, finally, so why is it important for faith communities like us here at First Congregational to continue to show that we are open and affirming? Which, if you haven't heard the specific term open and affirming, it means that within the life and work of our church, LGBTQ people are included, valued, celebrated um, in every part of that. So why is that important for faith communities to, to, to project that welcome? I think that a lot of young people are figuring out who they are and when they're queer, they kind of just assume that they're not welcome. Um, they assume that it's like, written into the religion that they can't go to church mm -hmm. and that no one is going to accept them there and that they're going to be pushed out. Um, and I think religion is kind of one of the fabrics of society that helps keep us together. And so I think mm -hmm. being able to explore that without feeling othered is really important because um, it can help build who you are as a person. I know I went to church when I was younger, but it never really felt like I was allowed to be there. Mm. Um, and so I kind of just went to like hang out with my friends. <laughs> um, and I think if I was younger and I went to a church like this, I maybe would still be, you know, like faithful. I don't know. You never know. But yeah, I never was really given the chance to. Yeah. 
I'm sorry for that. I think it's absolutely essential that these communities and these churches and these religions that are preaching so much about love and about acceptance and about loving everyone, that they really show that in um, how they, how, what language they are using and how they are showing up. Um, and I think it's very important for faith communities to be open and accepting. Yeah. It means so much to all of us. Yeah, it's powerful, right? And I think, oh, that's so kind. Thank you. Sometimes in our bubble, sometimes nine years after marriage equality, sometimes surrounded by people who believe like us, it's easy to forget how pervasive the voices of shame and rejection are and how deep those wounds can go when they're spoken out of the name of God. We all have a profound opportunity to bear witness to a very different gospel, a very different God, a very different way of being Christian. And it is, it continues to be incredibly relevant to our community and to our world. I want to share one other young person's reflections on that same point who wasn't able to be here today, but was part of our conversation a couple weeks ago. They said, when I think about church, my first response is fear of being hurt. It's so nice to hear that there are religious people who are okay with me. That is so powerful. And it is okay to not understand it all. What matters is to accept us and show respect for who we are. Thank you for being a people where I feel safe bringing these two young people to share this morning um, and for listening in on a conversation that hopefully goes past the nuts and bolts of how we use the pronoun and pierces into that transformation of the heart. And thank you too for being willing to come and share. I'll take that box if you want to hand it over. <laughs> and make yourselves vulnerable in, in front of these folks who most of whom you don't know, but you do know some, Noah. <laughs> I appreciate um, everything you offer me and I appreciate who you are in the world to, um, to so many folks. Thank you, I love you both. All right.
Our worship service is coming near its end, but church is much more than this hour on Sunday morning. And so a few opportunities that I invite you to. If you are visiting this morning, welcome. Um, Please join us for coffee or tea afterwards if you wish. And if you'd like to be contacted or connect a little further, there should be a blue card in your pew. And if there's not, there are some on the welcome desk in the back, um, just so that somebody might connect with you um, sometime in the next week or so. Um, Let's see. The Elizabeth Station group will gather this Tuesday. Um, Drop in between 5.30 and 7 p.m. for conversation and connection at Elizabeth Station. Arts and Worship Board. All ages. ages. Thank you, Paige. All ages. It's not just the 20s, 30s, 40s anymore. (laughs) The Arts and Worship Board is preparing for our 20th, 25th anniversary of Open and Affirming. And they're planning a new art installation for the sanctuary. It takes all of us to make it happen, and many of you have been helping to make paper cranes over the last couple months. We still need about 300 more paper cranes, and so there is paper in the social hall, I believe, that you can take some home after worship and um, continue to make paper cranes for that art installation. Other, oh, let's see, Um, Gabe has COVID today, and so if anybody's able or willing to help clean up coffee hour after folk enjoy some goodies after worship, that would be wonderful. And after worship today, as Paige mentioned, we invite you to grab coffee or tea and join in, I'll I'll give you a room in a minute, um, for a conversation about gender diversity. This is not for gender diverse people because we want the rest of us, for those of us who may feel uncomfortable with these new things to us or um, wanting to have a little more safe place to ask questions, that's who this gathering is for. Um, Paige will answer your questions, break down some myths, and help us all feel more confident and comfortable with the concepts and language that some of us are just beginning to learn. We will also talk about some simple yet powerful ways to help gender diverse folk feel more welcome here in our space of this congregation. Um, And so my question is, we're trying to figure out what room we might need. If you think you might join this gathering, would you be willing to raise your hand? So one, two, three. Uh, 21, how many chairs do we have set up? Okay, so we're going to move into room 1214 downstairs. So if you don't know where that room is, um, find somebody else. We will help you find it. Um, So yes, it'll be in 1214 downstairs. We'll set up the chairs. Uh, That's all the announcements I have for us this morning. Please, if there are other opportunities in the Friday announcements email, because we are gearing up for the fall, so there's going to be a lot happening, please read that if you haven't recently. Um, But let's go ahead and share this morning's offering.
Let your heart be pierced. Be awestruck by the liberty that stands in front of you. See the ways that God has created and is co-creating with us that is brand new and that is yours for the taking. And then, my friends, sing a world into being. Let us pass the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you.